Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. I'm so excited because, again, we're going to be looking at the addendum of the Hathor material. I can't remember what part, what section we're on because it's, it's been a little interrupted because of some whistleblowers we had on. But I will place the previous episode down in the description box below in case you missed it. Today, we're going to be picking up with intergalactic karma interesting right on page 197 of the Hathor material this is a very complex issue because you have so many intergalactic streams or genetic lines present on your planet and not all of those are fit phys not all of those physically on your planet are human even though they may look human and that's the thing, you guys, that's why planet Earth, from what I understand, that is what why planet Earth is such a prize is because we, you know, I've said this before. The 12 tribes of Israel, the good tribes of Israel are the galactic tribes. Jacob's uh, descendants from the Bible, Jacob from the Bible, that's that's the controllers. That's the 13 families that are the controllers. Jacob was Satanist pretty clear in the bible that he would he would not worship in the same god that i worship at least my god doesn't demand burnt offerings to moloch or yahweh because yahweh is moloch so um so yeah so we are the genetic makeup of all these different intergalactic beings that's why we're so special and why we're so powerful this is an odd thing to consider in terms of the karmic laws of the universe all civilizations whether galactic or terrestrial have to work out their karma so there are multiple levels of karma being worked out through the solar system, this galaxy, and this universe. It is so complex that we almost would not wish to comment on it because it would take up too much time. It would not serve the individual. And all karma is, though, is really is work. It's a cause and effect. It's your work. However, you can say that what is happening on this planet at this time is absolutely unique in intergalactic history. It has never occurred before exactly like it is occurring here and now. Consequently, as this planet goes up in frequency and all beings on it also go through the higher portal, karmic debts are being paid at very rapid paces. Observers from other realms are looking at the situation with great interest to see how fast karma is being balanced and how gentle or how violent that balancing is. It is of extreme interest to those observers who realize that the law of karma is an inner impersonal law of the universe and where better to learn its pattern than here on earth where a hotbed of activity is occurring on many levels with the rapid paying and redeeming of karma. As karma is cleared, destiny can change. And in that regard, Earth is a focal point of intense karmic activity at the moment. And this again mirrors what the Law of One has said about what we're going through right now. This is the only time a planet has ever upgraded with living beings on it. Normally, when a planet goes through an ascension process, all the living beings on the planet have to get off the planet. So basically, we got to die in order for um, the planet to ascend. So this is the one time in galactic history that beings, living beings, as in humanoid animals, plant life, can actually ride the roller coaster with Mother Earth. And that's why all the souls on the planet right now are high priority souls uh, and also some organic por portals, which... Maybe by the time this episode is aired, we've talked about organic, organic portals. That is an episode that I have coming up with a guest speaker to talk about or, what organic portals are. Um, but but yeah, that's why there's not many really, really many young souls on the earth right now. Um, because what's happening right now is really intense, um, as you know. <laughs> Um, and so most of the souls here are equipped to handle what's happening, even though it doesn't feel like it sometimes, uh, we'll talk about when we do our episode, Catherine Edwards and I are going to do, are going to be doing an episode of the law of one with a, a law of one, um, aficionado, aficionado, um, that can talk about like the wanderers and what all this means and different densities and all that kind of stuff. So if you are familiar with the law of one though, that ring, that, 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 that resonates, right? What they're saying and what raw is saying are based is basically the same thing buckle up buttercup is what they're saying like it feels hectic because it is <laughs> regarding the nature of the four elements humanity has become so di disconnected from its own biological roots that it could easily devastate the planet as an antidote to this disconnectedness from nature we recommend that you become more aware of your biological rootedness and your connection to other life forms on this planet 
the fundamental understanding in many primitive or indigenous cultures is that the natural world is alive, meaning consciousness. Describing this aliveness as the deeper archetypal level of four elements of earth, fire, water, air, and space may be a helpful concept for some of you. The natural world consists of many interconnecting fields of energy. These fields are consciousness in that re they respond with intelligence to changes in and around them. Mist, for example, can be viewed at the chemical level merely as water vapor, but this is only one aspect of its reality. Some types of mist are actually conscious, ephemeral beings, and you can, if you understand how, actually communicate with them. This communication, by the way, is done through your feeling nature and not through language. That makes sense to me as someone who um, is very sensitive to the other side of the veil. I'm sure some of you who are also very sensitive to the other side of the veil can kind of comment about that, that it very much is a feeling nature versus like a literal, literal language. If you're one of those people who is offended by the world primitive, so much so that you would prefer a more con contemporary world like foundational, may we suggest that you put too much value on sophistication and abstraction that you are too far into the material realm to be connected to the bio biological reality of your existence. Oh, snap. I think the Hathor is just, just roasted the woke people. <laughs> we could we would tell you that it is the biological level of your existence and not your mental level that is the tap root from which consciousness flows into and it expresses itself into your earthly domain the fire element in devas archangel michael is connected with fire but an etheric fire which is a different kind of fire than the element of fire that compromises this earth plane the term deva refers to beings that move through the earth plane and that are associated with different aspects like the growth of plants, etc. There are devic forces throughout creation. There are many devas. There is also a devic con con consciousness that you could use to describe the consciousness of these four elements. So there is a devic consciousness that is fire. There is a devic consciousness that is water and so forth. And I know a lot of people are going to have a problem with that because unfortunately there are a lot of really fast asleep people in the truther community um that still think in black and white and are still very um violent in thought and still very vigilante in thought and so usually those are the fundamentalists um and i want to really point out to you guys that if you're somebody who is still blindly following a church or a religion or a scripture without question or blindly following a truther without question you're no different than the people who are blindly following dr f no different you're still asleep and so when we talk about devas i know a lot of the christian folk like to say that you know, every apparently every spirit is bad to them except for god um that's not true that's black and white thinking and black and white thinking is considered a mental disorder so um be a little bit more open-minded you know, we're not God. I mean, we are God. We are a fractal God. But when we limit ourselves in our belief because of what we've been indoctrinated to believe, then we limit the growth of our consciousness. And if we limit the growth of our consciousness, we're not going to ascend. So another clarification regarding the sacred four elements. If you view a human egg and look at the genetic information as held within its DNA codes, you will see what we call the subtle level of biology. This level is very basic, primitive, and the essential to the expression of consciousness as a human life. As you go subtler into the atomic matrix from which all genetic information is created and go subtler still, meaning smaller and smaller, you will get to a domain where you enter pure consciousness, where consciousness and matter are directly related. And in some ways, they are the same, though they manifest at different vibratory rates. In consciousness, just prior to the beginning levels of the atomic structure, a blueprint is held for the genetics and for that potential of a human in some future time. This is the archetypal realm about which we spoke earlier. Within that archetypal realm are powerful energies that become the atomic forces known to your physics. The sacred four elements are the archetypal dimensional blueprint for the unfolding of consciousness into matter in the form of the four elements. 
furthering thoughts regarding the four elements. Your body is a sacred temple, for it is where heaven and earth conjoin, where celestial and and terrestrial forces meet. Your life is a gift born from the four elements. Without them, the universe would not exist. They respond to your love. Send them your gratitude and receive their message. Creation speaks to you through them with every breath you take and with every beat of your heart. Be still and listen. The return to balance. Everything in the universe is sickle in nature and dualistic in nature until you get to the fundamental octave that integrates all duality and unity. But all these things in the universe, the physical universe and all the other subtle universes have polarity. In terms of human metaphors, these polarities are masculine and feminine or positive and negative electoral charges. We talk a lot about the polarity of third density on this channel a lot. That's, it, that's where we get the friction, the opposing forces that give us friction. At the time of our coming to the early consciousness of mankind, before the time of ancient Egypt, your emerging consciousness was touched was in touch with the great earth, which you might call great mother. The great religions of the past referred to the earth as the great mother. And so it was that early humans were deeply connected to this earth matrix, this consciousness of the earth as feminine. The feminine mysteries and the feminine nature were the fundamental expressions of consciousness at that time. Then as the feminine began to be overtaken by what could be termed as the masculine, we observed certain things occurring. Humans began a disconnection from the earth and a movement into autonomy. While it is important that mankind come to the real realization of its autonomy, being disconnected from Earth and from the interconnectedness of all life is very dangerous. In the formative period of Egyptian cosmology, the goddess Hathor was associated with the, with the sky. It was later that Hathor became identified as the fertility goddess. It is no accident that her name and ours are similar. We seated and assisted this early symbol of the feminine mystery, the goddess Hathor does have an independent existence separate from us, and she is what you might call an archetypal pattern. She is a cosmic force that can come from anthropomorphized as we identify with her qualities of love, ecstasy, and bliss. Presently, human consciousness has gone through two polarities. The earth as the consciousness called the great mother, and now the autonomy or masculine consciousness of the father. But neither polarity has come together. It is vital that these two polarities be joined in balance if human destiny is to unfold into its higher expressions. There is a sensing by those who are aware and awake that the feminine and the masculine elements of human consciousness must be balanced. They realize the war between the male and female polarities must be ended so that the autonomy of the masculine principle and the receptivity of the feminine can be returned to balance. And there's an editor's note here that says the Hathors are addressing an archetypal duality expressed metaphorically as the masculine and feminine principles. They are not directing their comments to differences between genders. Indeed, they hold the belief that both men and women are capable of being autonomous and receptive and that this dual capacity can make them more resourceful and creative in their lives yes and we know that we're we know that on this channel i mean if you study yoga you know that um i am a feminine i'm considered a divine feminine um and a male is a masculine and a divine masculine but within me and within a male are both energy cycles this comes again from the left nostril and the right nostril left is feminine uh right is masculine hence why my left nostril is pierced because i am feminine i'm a woman so it represents if you go to india and you're a woman, they will not pierce your right nostril because you are a woman. They will pierce your left, noting that you are the divine feminine. But it does not mean that you still, you have the right side too, which is the masculine. Does that make sense? As the feminine arises again out of her ashes, so to speak, the ancient mysteries of Egypt are returning. Many of you are remembering your roots in ancient Egypt and these earlier times, but it is a time for the feminine to reawaken. Let us suggest that the feminine is returning in a different way than before as a balanced principle, not totally feminine, not totally masculine, masculine, but an endogenous merging into the two balance. And by understanding this, we can clearly see what the bad side of this war has tried to do to invert that. Because once again, the darkness cannot create anything. Let me repeat that again for those in the back who didn't hear. If you think that Lucifer or the Luciferians can create something, you're giving them too much credit. 
Darkness can't create anything. They can't. That's why narcissists steal. That's why organic portals steal. If you've ever had someone in your life that's like mimicking everything you do and like taking your story, it's because they're probably an organic portal, meaning that they are of the darkness. They can't create their own stuff, so they have to steal from you. Okay, that's what darkness does. It steals and it inverts. It twists and inverts. So we can see the good side of this and how it's being twisted by the bad. Time and timeless. Our perspective is that consciousness expresses itself into a through into and through matter, and that matter is then elevated by consciousness into it. Life then becomes increasingly more complex and more elevated until finally you have a consciousness that can hold an awareness of itself in relationship to nature. Then it can hold a consciousness of the relationship between itself and itself, which is self-awareness. Then it can become aware of the force behind nature or within nature. And that is what we call the all that is. For you at this time of your evolution, the process of moving into elevated states of being a curse through having a human form. We do not see this as a curse. We do not see this as a punishment. We see this as a tremendous opportunity for the expression of your consciousness through the balancing of two polarities, your own non-local consciousness, which is timeless and formless, along with your localized consciousness or bodily awareness, which is most definitely bound in time and form. It is a unique dichotomy. The pressure between these two, the part of you which is timeless, and the physical part of you in time creates the alchemical flow of magnetism and out of the flow of consciousness can be elevated. Purusha Prakriti, Shiva Shakti, we talk about this all the time, right? That's what Patanjali says in the Yoga Sutras causes human suffering. You are living in a mortal body with an immortal spirit. Your body's going to die, your soul's not. But your, your suffering comes from the fact that you mistake who you are with who you are temporarily. So I see myself as Bryce, but Bryce is not forever. Bryce is just an illusion. It's not real. It's just an expression of my soul. And so what is real is the soul. But I don't see the soul. I see the illusion of self, the Maya. But within this dichotomy, as they're calling it, within this friction, this opposing forces, we're able to then realize the self, the self that knows itself, the self that becomes aware of itself. The soul decided to do this, to put us in this little trick of illusions so that the soul could then know itself, so we can become aware, self-aware that there is a soul residing within the ego body, the false sense of self. Pretty cool, huh? It's so funny. I was talking to my boyfriend this morning about, you know, yoga. The practice of yoga it was the original conspiracy theory, right? Patanjali, the writer of the Yoga Sutras, he was the original conspiracy theorist. Because in order to practice yoga, you have to know that, that, that there's something wrong and that the world is an illusion. It's not real. So what is real? You're challenging the matrix when you practice yoga. You're challenging it because you're going, no, no, something's not right. What, what? It's that soul trying to know itself. The self is going, wait, this is actually... Well, there's something there's something wrong with this picture. You're starting to see the truth of the illusion, so you practice yoga in order to help you see the truth through the illusion. The new dimension which we speak of is a new understanding of time and space. It is an opportunity for individuals to pass through three-dimensional consciousness into fourth-dimensional consciousness and beyond. This shift into a new dimension occurs on many levels, so we will describe a few of its major attributes. One attribute of the new dimension is that of instantaneous manifestation. In fact, you can tell you're getting closer to this dimensional shift into the new dimension when events in your life move faster in the length of time between the moments you think or say something until the time it happens gets shorter and shorter. Many are already experiencing this. I just experienced this this morning. I was actually, I won't say what it was, but I was actually like gobsmacked, like gobsmacked. I experienced it a few weeks back when I was really like pissy about my laptop and I just kind of threw my hands in the air and I said, you know, God, like if you want me to keep making videos, if this is what you want me doing, I need a new computer. And lo and behold, that day, one of the students at AYA said, hey, my brother has a brand spanking new Mac computer with all the storage that he's giving away. Boom. There you go. So they're, they're correct. There will be a new appreciation of the earth and the earth herself will go through a radical change during which she will become more conscious. There will be a global connectedness of beings and it will be as if all humanity becomes one mind and one consciousness. We say as if to indicate that we are using a metaphor. Individual consciousness and awareness will still exist, but there will also be the sense that there is one consciousness operating through complex diversity. There will indeed be a feeling of direct connection to one another and also to the earth. 
instantaneous manifestation in global consciousness could be perceived as miracles by those who don't understand the principles involved. But when you understand the energetic principles that hold events together, you understand the acceleration of time that takes place as you enter into another dimension. Then it does not seem to be a miracle at all. It's just the way things are. Your transitioning into a higher dimension will involve all aspects of you being at you be at, of your being that resides within third dimensional reality regarding the human shift to higher dimensions. Let us say another thing about human anticipation of shifting into higher dimensions. There are some who truly believe that by going into fourth dimension and beyond, they will leave their problems behind them. They feel that life's dilemmas will somehow be miraculously transformed so they won't have to deal with their current issues. These individuals are in for a surprise. I've said that as, as well. <laughs> Thank you, Athors. Thank you, Athors. You got to work on your shit. It's not going anywhere. That's just your privilege. It is your privilege to work on your karma. No one's coming to save you. And that's your privilege. That no one is coming. You have to do it yourself. You were made to do it yourself. Your issues continue with you into consciousness no matter what dimension you go into. It's simply that you work them out in the vibratory field of that dimension. So our advice to you at this time is very simple. Don't focus on what dimension you're going to enter when it will happen or even if the dimensions are actually shifting. Focus on your capacity to love and to forgive. Do your work where you are. Or as some of you are fond of saying, bloom where you are planted. Because one of my favorite sayings is wherever you go, there you are. Doesn't matter if it's a new boyfriend, if it's a new house, if it's a new country, if it's a new job, if it's a new hairstyle. Wherever you go, there you are. Your problems only change when you work on them. Regarding the absolute and the relative realms of consciousness. The absolute realm of consciousness interpenetrates or permeates the universe. The absolute has no single location of its own because it is in all locations at the same time. It is both the quantum field and subtler than the quantum field that generates all phenomenon. The relative realm of consciousness is everything that exists as phenomena, including that which you know through your senses, because everything that happens in is in relationship to something else. That's karma. Everything that happens is in relationship to something else. Karma, cause and effect, action, reaction. Nothing is truly independent. Everything is interrelated. For instance, if the trees and plants on this planet stopped pr a process of photosynthesis, thus no longer produce oxygen, the human species and many civil civilizations would not last very long. They would disappear. Life as you know it would be gone. Mankind, who so arrogantly considers itself to be the pinnacle of nature, would actually be eliminated if the plant world disappeared. We are all interrelated. Even other dimensions are interrelated. This is why events on planet Earth are so critical and important and why observers are coming from other realms to follow the outcome. They come because the unfolding of events on this planet is creating reverberations that are moving interdimensionally. And these reverberations are affecting and will continue to affect other universes. So all things really are interconnected. The ascension of the planet has tremendous repercussions because the energetic shifts to higher octaves are so profound. It's as if you were listening to someone playing the piano in the middle range of the keyboard that all of a sudden they go one octave higher, whereupon the music changes radically and everything in relation to it also changes. And this is what is happening to you. As the earth transmits to higher dimensions, everything in relationship to the earth is affected. This includes all organisms and beings, not just humans. Your solar system is affected and through the law of resonance, the rest of the universe and even other dimensions are affected. So it is a very positive thing that is getting ready to happen. And it holds much interest to those who understand the process and for those who have the means to get here to observe. And we know that regarding consciousness. Let us first approach the subject of consciousness using the hermetic proposition. As above, so below. As within, so without. Or as Sean Stone said on my channel once, which I love, as with the macro, so with the micro. 
This simply means that any level of consciousness will recapulate or reflect those levels above it and below it. It is simply a matter of scope or dimension. If you look at human, the human nervous system, you can see that it has the possibility of self-awareness. Humans are not only aware of their environment, but in certain states of mind, they are aware that they are aware of their environment. This self-reflection, this is self-reflection or self-awareness. We do in yoga. This is everything that's in yoga. From physical standpoint, this is made possible because the brain is organized so that it can neurologically re reference back to itself. This is self-consciousness or self-awareness. When you are awake or aware of what is happening around you, you are conscious. However, as a human, you are generally aware of less than 1% of the perceptual reality. This is due to the fact that your brain filters out most of what you perceive according to what you expect to perceive and also because your five senses only provide a very narrow frequency bandwidth of light, light sound, and other energy realities. Unless you're RH negative. <laughs> and then your eyeball is shaped different in the back so it sees more light. They call it astigmatism. It's not your eyes just shaped different so you see light differently. With the narrow bandwidth, there is a rich world to be discovered and explored. However, it is not only a tiny percentage of what is actually occurring. If you were to sit in your chair in your room while reading this book, you would be aware of what is happening in the room and also aware of what is going on in your mind as you read these words. But you would probably not be aware of what is happening 100 miles away from you because your nervous system does not extend that far. Your five senses are reporting from a very localized place. There are states of consciousness you can enter and experience. The yogis <laughs> and the ancients have explored extensively, as I was saying. There we go. It is possible, as your Western science is already beginning to verify, that in certain states of consciousness, a person sitting in a room can become aware of what is happening hundreds of miles away. This phenomenon is called remote viewing and is possible due to the existence of the subtle nervous system, which is non-localized. I can remote view. I didn't know... I didn't know that's what I was doing. I've been doing it since I was a kid. I had no idea. I can also astral travel. Also didn't know I was doing that. Didn't figure out I was actually doing that until my late 30s. And I was like, oh, that's what that is. I've heard people talk about this, but I didn't know I was doing it too. So totally get that. And, and when you know, it was after, I mean, I've been doing it since I was a kid, but it was after like years and over a decade worth of yoga where I actually started to really notice what was happening. And then in this community, I was like, oh shit, this is what I'm doing. I'm astro traveling and I'm a re remote viewing. So yeah, we all have these abilities. We just got to tap into our consciousness to be able to explore the possibility of what we can actually do. All right. The physical nervous system, the brain, spinal cord, and the peripheral nerves Senses highly restricted bandwidths of sensory information, while the subtler nervous system is less bound by the physical nervous system and thus is closer to the quantum field of consciousness itself. As the subtle nervous system becomes more developed, awareness can extend into the quantum field where it is possible to pull information to yourself that is non-local, meaning beyond where you are physically located. This, these impressions are received in the brain as with the physical nervous system, but the source of the impression is not sensory as most people think of such things. As you move deeper and deeper into consciousness, you become more non-localized, more connected to the greater realm of awareness, so that finally, at the deepest levels of consciousness, you are aware of all things. This is called being omniscient. It is a potential for humans to reach this state. Of course, at that point, you would hardly be human by human standards today, but you could still has a, have a physical form. Even in your limited historical records, there are reports of beings who have attained various degrees of omniscience through entering the deepest subtle states of consciousness. However, unless you move awareness beyond your physical senses, omniscience is impossible. It is a matter of scope. By scope, we mean the territory of which you are aware. If you're focused on the world's Words of this page, for instance, you will not be aware of your surroundings. If, however, you were to look around you, your scope would change and you would see things that you were not aware of before. Consciousness is like this as well. If you if your focus is only the five senses, then that is what you will sense. Where the mind goes, that's where energy follows, right? If you develop your subtle nervous system as well, you will also begin to sense other levels of awareness. 
These other levels of awareness are part of the fabric of underpinning of the universe. But when your primary focus is the five senses, these subtle impressions are eclipsed. The principle of scope refers to which frequency dominion you are attending to, where you put your attention in other words. In terms of consciousness, the walls are very clear. The principle of scope determines that what you are potentially aware of. And if you expand the scope of your conscious awareness, then you will be able to enter the subtle realms of consciousness, the bedrock from which all things emerge into existence. If you do not expand your scope or focus, you cannot enter the subtle realms. And I think we'll end it there, guys. Uh, we'll talk about grounding to the earth next week. Let me know your thoughts and your opinions down in the comment section below. Also, have you guys been like astro traveling and astro projecting and all that kind of stuff? Like, let me know your experiences. I know in the shadow work challenge, it's interesting because in the shadow work challenge, we just talked about subtle body and gross body. And that's one thing we spoke, we focus a lot on, on in yoga is you have to go through the gross body first. By the gross body, I mean the sensations of your physical body, like feeling your hamstrings, feeling your biceps, feeling your stomach. But the more you kind of really exhaust the gross body, you start to go deeper into your level of awareness. It just happens naturally into the subtle body. And that's, that's where things get good. All right, you guys, I'll talk to you soon.